Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight at Wash by the Word. Um, for those of you that are normally here, but you're uh, tuning in now, uh, thanks for being here. And uh, thanks for staying home. I know there's uh, a lot of you that say, I feel really good. I feel really good. But we're staying home not for ourselves as much as just for those that are a little bit more susceptible to what's going on here with this uh, virus and all. So thanks for staying home. Thanks for joining us. We're going to do something a little bit different tonight. We want you to be part of this a little bit, however we can. So one of the things we're going to be doing is encouraging you to call in any time between now and 8.30 with any prayer, uh, praise reports you might have, any prayer requests you might have. And um, just call this number. Our number, of course, is 505-830-6533. That's 830-6533. Call any time if you have a prayer request. We're going to bring them in, and at the end of the service tonight, we're going to just be praying for the prayer requests, the praise reports, and just stay um, connected a little bit more if we can. I'd also make the, a quick announcement. I'll repeat it at the end of the service, and that is if you have any needs, as you know, most of you, we've uh, tried to get in touch with, either with uh, myself or Pastor Anthony or Pastor Klesson or Pastor Gill, and try and just touch bases with you all. If you have any needs at all, uh, let us know. We have a number of people that have volunteered to go out and shop for you, uh, make deliver, or pick up deliveries, pick up things and make deliveries for you, whatever it might be. So feel free to call us, and we'll be glad to help you, whatever's going on. So again, thanks for being here tonight, and um, let's pray, and we're going to get started. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time just to get together here. God, we ask that you would protect the people, specifically the people that are least susceptible to this virus, Lord. And we ask God those with pre-existing conditions, those that um, have seen a lot of sunrises, Lord, that um, you just protect them. And God, I thank you for the, the many people who are going way beyond just to make certain that this virus doesn't spread too quickly. So God, we're asking just your hand to rest on us. And as we get into your word tonight, Lord, and as we look at some of the principles in your word, God, we ask that you would use us just to be a prayer covering to be a light shining in the midst of a confusing time right now. So God, we ask that you administer to us as we worship you, as we get into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Living. 
your name on high And I'd love to sing your praise And I'm so glad you're in my life And I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth To show the way from the earth 
anyways. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Again, I want to just mention our number, 505-830-6533. If you have any prayer requests, please uh, call them in, and that's what we will do. We have one prayer request. Uh, it is from Rose Merch, Willie and Rose. Um, their grandson, Cade, and his mom, Cassie, uh, they are in quarantine right now. So um, they haven't got the results back yet. Her store was closed. One of the workers tested positive. So that's kind of what's going on. So we want to um, be praying for Rose's family. So let's go ahead and do that before we get started. Kate and his mother, Cassie. God, we do lift up Kate and Cassie to you. Lord, we lift up so many people right now that are in this situation. God, we're asking your grace, your grace to rest on them. We're asking for your hand to rest on them. And God, um, if, they, if they do uh, come back positive, we, we ask God there would be a quick recovery. We pray for those that are in ICU units right now, people who are really struggling right now. Again, we ask God that your hand would rest on them. God, that you would show yourself strong. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, we're going to be in the book of Exodus tonight. We'll be in Exodus chapter 20 as we continue on in our study in Exodus. We are at one of the more, um, I don't hate to say important, but one of the more well-known passages of Scripture. Today, as I was getting ready to come down here, I washed my hands for about the, I don't know, 40th time today. And um, as I was doing that, there's a mirror above our sink, and I was looking at that. I remember our study in James, where the Word of God acts like a mirror to us. And that's what the law does. One of the, one of the purposes of the law is to show us that we are sinners. And the sink is where I washed, the mirror is what I looked at to see where I needed to wash. And how important it is for us to remember that the law can never cleanse us. The law is here to show us God's standard, his moral standard, and how far short we fall from that. There's a verse that I'm going to start us off with uh, that talks about that very thing, about not washing in the mirror, but washing in the basin. Not washing in the law, but washing in the blood. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And many of you are very much familiar with that experience. So I want to remember that going forward uh, tonight as we get into the Word. There is so much confusion about the law. And one of the things we want to remember is that there are three different types of the law mentioned in the New Testament, interestingly enough. Have a seat. Glad you're here, girl. And, and that is, is we have the law of God, mentioned in Romans chapter 7. Paul talks about the law of God. Then we have the law of Moses in John chapter 7. Jesus refers to the law of Moses. And then over in Galatians chapter 2 verse 6, we see the law of Christ. So in the New Testament, there are three different references to the law. The law of God, the law of Moses, and the law of Christ. And it's important for us so we don't have a confusion in this. All three of these things are different. So the law of God differs from the law of Moses, which differs from the law of Christ. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight to try and see if we can clear that up a little bit. The law of God, we refer to it as the Ten Commandments. Literally, it is the ten words. In Hebrew, that's what it says, the ten words, or the ten commandments. It's one of the two focal points of the Torah, one of the two focal points of the Pentateuch, one of the two focal points of the Old Testament. The first one being the Passover, we saw in Exodus chapter 12, and now here in Exodus chapter 20, we come to the ten words. It expresses these ten words. We call them the Ten Commandments growing up and all, but it expresses the mind of God, the Creator God, His mind, and it's binding on all rational creatures. It's God's unchanging moral standard for regulating conduct for all men. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Abolition of Man, talks about this a little bit. He says there's this universal morality among all ancient cultures. It's written on the hearts of man. They, they've never heard of God. They've never heard of Jesus. But they have this morality. And in every ancient culture going forward, it's, <clears throat> it's known that um, that's wrong. It's wrong to kill someone. 
It's wrong to take from someone else. It's wrong to mess with someone's wife or someone's husband. It's wrong. It's just, just it's accepted in all the ancient cultures. The law of God written on the heart of man all the way back from Adam. So we're going to be looking at this law of God tonight. We'll make a brief mention of the law of Moses. We're going to be looking at the law of Moses later, known as the Book of the Covenant. We're going to see that the law of Moses was given to the nation of Israel during their wilderness wanderings. It's recorded in chapters 21 of Exodus, 22 of Exodus, 23 of Exodus, the book of Leviticus, the book of Deuteronomy. That is known as the law of the covenant or the law of Moses. In Acts chapter 15, and those of you at home that are, are studying, you can look at that, just jot it down. But in Acts chapter 15, you remember the Jerusalem council. And there in the Jerusalem council, it was made very clear, very clear, that the law of Moses, it doesn't say the law of God, the law of Moses is not for the Gentiles, it's for the Jews. Because you see, it was the law of the covenant. The law of God, the ten words, the ten commandments, that's for everybody on the planet. The law of Moses, 21, 22, and 23 of Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, was given specifically to a covenant people, the nation of Israel. And that is the, the rules and regulations, if you will, for the nation of Israel. Gentiles are not under the law of Moses. We're under the law of God, a distinction. When we get into Galatians chapter 6, the law of Christ is the law of God through the means of a mediator, Jesus Christ. So now we have the law of God through Christ. So we see these three different laws. It's going to be important to, to make that distinction. As we look at the law of God, we're going to see some interesting things going through it. Uh, tonight, we're only going to cover the first four commandments. But we're going to notice that there are a lot of negatives. There are a lot of abrupt and absolute commands. You shall not. You shall not. You shall not. And it's, it's just, there they are. They're just out there. There's no reason given. It's just, this is what it is. It's an absolute command. It's moral absolutes. It is interesting because in the United States of America, in a, a poll within the last 10 years, over 70% of Americans today do not believe in moral absolutes. And yet, the very foundation of our Creator and Him expressing His desires for us are all moral absolutes. It tells us a little bit of where we are in America. We have raised a generation without moral absolutes. It is interesting, in 1990, and let's see if I can find it here, but in 1990, uh, Ted Turner, old guys remember Ted Turner, young folks don't know who that was, but he owned the, uh, the Atlanta Braves for a long time. He was a, a media guy. But he, um, right here they are. He came up with something, he said, to replace the Ten Commandments, because they were so archaic. So in 1990, he came up with not the Ten Commandments, but he called them Ten Voluntary Initiatives. And this tells you where we had come as a nation in 1990. The first one, I love and respect planet Earth and all living things thereon, especially my fellow species, mankind. Initiative number two. I promise to treat all people everywhere with dignity and respect. Number three, I promise to have no more than two children. Number four, he had five, by the way, I always found it interesting, but anyway, I promise to use my best efforts to help save what is left of our natural world and restore any damaged or destroyed areas whenever it's practical. Number five, I pledge to use as little non-renewable resources as possible. Number six, I pledge to use as little toxic chemicals, pesticides, and poisons as possible. Number seven, I promise to contribute to those less fortunate than myself to help them become self-sufficient. Number eight, I reject the use of force, and particularly military force, and I back the United Nations arbitration of international disputes. Number nine, I support the total elimination of all nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. Unemployment, that's called. Number 10, I support the United Nations in its efforts to improve the conditions of the planet. 
So there are the ten voluntary initiatives that takes place when humanism comes to the forefront and we try to develop our own state of initiatives, I guess. That has nothing to do with the law of God. It just shows how far off we go when we remove God from our life. So as we look at this, we, we, we see these are all direct, you shall not, you shall not, you shall not. But then starting in chapter 21, and at home, just turn your Bibles over to chapter 21, verse 1, look at this. It says, now these are the judgments you shall set before them. Notice verse 2, if. Notice verse 14, or verse 7, and if. Notice verse 14, and if. Look at verse uh, 18, if men. Look at verse 20, and if a man. In verse 22, if men fight. And 26, if a man strikes. In verse 28, if an ox scores. You get the picture. These are a bunch of ifs and whens. Not if then statements, if whens. If and when. If these things happen, then do this. This is considered case law. So we have the Decalogue, the first Ten Commandments. These are just strat don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, followed by case law, chapters 21, 22, 23, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. So it's a whole different set of law. It's the law of Moses, specifically for the Jewish people, the covenant people. It has nothing to do with you and me in our day-to-day -day life, other than we want to just choose to follow it for good health or whatever. We want to look at the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, the Law of God. That's what we're going to be looking at as we go on tonight. We're going to spend a lot of time in the Ten Words the next two weeks. And then we're going to walk through rather quickly the case law of the Law of Moses because it's applying to a people group in the wilderness and then in Deuteronomy and agrarian society as they settle into the Promised Land, how these different ifs and whens affect a, 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 a a sedate people, someone who is there. So, let's take a look. Chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying. The key in Hebrew, the emphasis on this, these first couple of verses, is that God spoke these words. These are words directly from God. The rest of the covenant of Moses, or the law of Moses, Moses is going to be recording them. This is directly spoken from God. And that is really emphasized in the Hebrew. And God spoke all these words. What makes them non-negotiable is who spoke them. God spoke these words. And God spoke all these words saying, notice the first thing he says, I am the Lord your God. He does not say, I am the Lord God. I am the Lord your God. In other words, he's saying, I made you. I know you. I wanted you just the way you are. That's why I made you like that. I wanted one of you. I am the Lord, your God. And I know what's best for you. This is the heart of God embedded into the heart of man from Adam on, for, on, on forward. So this is God saying, this is what I want for you. They're called the Ten Commandments. It might be more accurate to call them the tender commandments. This is a loving God saying, I know what's best for you. And as we go through these the next couple of weeks, it, it, it always amazes me for years when, when I had to memorize the Ten Commandments as a little kid in a Lutheran church and had to memorize the catechism, had to memorize these Ten Commandments. <clears throat> One of the amazing things to me is I remembered them, and in my recollection, we'll clear this up here later tonight, but in my rec recollection, Honor your father and mother was number four. And you shall not kill was number five. And number six was you shall not commit adultery. And number seven was you shall not steal. See, I still know. But it was kind of crazy. But I remember looking at that and saying, man, I can't kill anybody. Hmm. I can't steal anything. Hmm. But then I realized, after I came to Christ and started looking at this, it's not that I can't kill. See, God loves me. He doesn't want anybody coming around killing people I know. He doesn't want anybody stealing from me. I had a, a whole different look. This is a tender, loving God saying, I've got this great world I'm putting you in, and there's some crazy stuff out there. These are the tender commandments so you can enjoy all that I have for you. A loving God giving us the Ten Commandments.
So we're going to look at these commandments, and we're going to see that, man, this is the love of God is just oozing out of them. What I'd like to do, if you're at home watching right now, if you could take a look at 1 John. It's way in the back of your Bible. Not the Gospel of John, but 1 John. Go way back to the back. Revelation, and the little book right before Revelation, Jude, and then right before that, 3 John, 2 John. Whoop, there's 1 John right there. 1 John chapter 5. In 1 John chapter 5, we see something really sweet. It says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. Check it out. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. Isn't that something? Not... It's, it's that this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. If you're here tonight and say, well, I don't experience the love of God in my life. The question to ask is not where is God, the question is, are you keeping His commandments? Are you keeping this Decalogue, these top ten, if you will, right here? Because our Bibles say this is the love of God. If you want to experience the love of God, keep His commandments. His ten commandments, they are His personal instruction book right from the hand, right from the mouth, right from the mind of the manufacturer. God knows you. And he says, this is how you work the best. Keep these right here, these Ten Commandments. So in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Notice, and his commandments are not burdensome. <sighs> Rules produce liberty. Brushing our teeth every morning. Legalism? That's not legalism. It's refreshing. It's refreshing. Not only is it refreshing, it just, it's, it's, it's just good. I know tomorrow morning I'm going to brush my teeth. I'm going to do it. I don't have to make a decision every morning. I wonder if I should brush my teeth today. No, I'm just going to do it. It's amazing. You see, rules, they're refreshing. Not only are they refreshing, they release us from having to make a decision over and over and over again. We just know, I'm not going to do that because that's just, I'm, I'm going to brush my teeth. I don't have to think about it. I wonder if I should brush my teeth this month or next. No, you're just going to do it every day. You're going to do it. So it's refreshing. It refreshes me. It releases me. And it, it stops decay. It stops bad breath in the short term. So it not only refreshes me, it not only releases me, it relieves those around me. If you've ever been around folks with bad breath, and a lot of you are on keto, so I know you've been around people with bad breath. And you can brush and brush and brush, it makes no difference, you still just stink, you know. But it's amazing what happens with, with rules. They actually produce liberty. The same is true with God's Ten Commandments. They actually produce liberty. In most cities, you can go out at night and walk without fear of being uh, robbed. I said most cities, but you can. You can just go out for a walk without fear of being killed. There is freedom, there is liberty in a society with rules. So the rules are not a bad thing. In fact, as we look at these Ten Commandments, we're going to see that I can experience, we can experience God's love personally, and we can express our own love practically if we just live within the bounds of what God has said, this works best for my people. And this works in any society. Any society. He goes on, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Because of who God is, because of what God has done, because of where we once were, we now understand that he has the right to tell us what to do, and we have the responsibility to obey what he tells us to do. It kind of goes hand in hand. You see, these ten words, and that's what we're going to refer to them a lot here, these ten words were not invented here at Mount Sinai. These ten words were the heart of God, the mind of God, from the very moment Adam was created. And they've gone on throughout history. So, we take a look at these ten words. Tonight, we're going to look just at the first four. The first four commandments. The first four commandments regard our conduct before God. 
So these commandments have to do with our relationship with God. The first commandment in verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. The first commandment, don't worship false gods. You shall have no other gods before me. There's always the temptation to worship other gods. Baal, we see him throughout the scriptures, this god of power, this god of success. Ashtaroth, the, the god of sex, of sensuality, the god of pleasure. The saying today comes up based on Ashtoreth. If it feels good, do it. That's an Ashtoreth motto. Mammon, the god of money. The love of money does not necessarily rest in those that have money. There are many people with money and many people without money that have the love of money. Many of us in the, in the room are watching tonight. We can remember times when we were flush with cash and times we were kind of tight with cash. And some of us have a love of money if we have a lot of it or none of it. And some of us don't have a love of money if we have a lot of it or none of it. It has nothing to do with money. Money is an amoral thing. It's the love of money that causes the problems. But that's the God of mammon. And remember, it was Jesus who said, you cannot love God and mammon. So the choice is ours there. There's the, uh, the God Bacchus. Bacchus, uh, the God of wine, the Roman God of wine. Another God that is worshipped, placed right in there with God. There's a number of other local deities and we are always tempted to worship some of these same gods, not with the archaic names, but the same God behind the name. Maybe some of us here say, oh man, I've got a couple of these gods set up in the temple of my heart right now. I got great news for you all. Those of you that have been here for a while, you remember our study in 1 Samuel chapter 5. Remember when the Philistines captured the Ark of God? And they took the ark captive, remember, and they brought it to their temple, Dagon, that big old fish god. And they had the ark of God. Uh, to, to many of the Philistines, it was Israel's god in a box. In fact, unfortunately, a lot of God's people saw it that way. They said, man, the Philistines are pretty strong. We should bring God out there. Then we can't help it. But when we do that today sometimes with the Dallas Cowboys. If I go to church, they, they're going to have to win. You know, it's just what we do. It's the same concept, same concept. But they brought God in the box out into battle, and the Philistines captured God. Don't you hate it when your God is so small that the enemy gets to capture your God? But that's how they saw God. And it was gone. Ichabod, remember, the glory is left, and oh man, Eli fell over backwards, died. Things were going crazy all over the place in Israel. They got the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God. The Philistines rejoicing took the Ark of the Israel's God, put it in their temple next to Dagon. They went to bed just, this is awesome. We've got the God of the Israelites in our temple, Dagon. This is awesome. They got up in the morning and there was their fish God, Dagon, on his face, almost like he's bowing down to the God of Israel. Like, Whoop, set him back up, set him back up. Set, never had, just set him back up, remember? All day long, the Ark of the Covenant's there. Dagon is there next to him. For Samuel 5 at home, jot it down. You can read it if you haven't read it. It's pretty cool. They go to bed that night. The next morning they get up. Remember Dagon? He's back down on the ground. This time his head's off. His hands are cut off. Man, he's, he's toast. And they say, we've got to get rid of this God of Israel. He's, he's greater than our God. And if you have a false God set up in the temple of your heart, I'm here to tell you that our God is much greater. And he too can eradicate the false gods that we've allowed to be set up in our life, in our heart. It's not a 12-step program that'll do it. It's a one-step program. It's coming to Christ. It's repenting of what we've allowed into our life. And watch what God will do as He takes out the junk we've allowed to be set up, the false gods that we've allowed to, to be set up in our heart. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. Notice he says, before me. For years I used to think, and as a young boy, especially in catechism, you shall have no other gods before me. And I would have people say, the Minnesota Vikings are your God, God. And I'd say, yeah, but I like Jesus better. So I don't, they're not before God, they're after God. That's not at all what that's saying. It's not saying, well, as long as God is one, you can have two, three, and four gods behind him. Just make sure God is first. No, no one's before God. That's not what that means. That means to come into his presence, there should be no God. You see, when we come to Christ, we don't add Jesus to this, this group of gods that we have in our life. No, we give Jesus 100% of who we are. 
He gets 100% of us, and all the other gods flee. They're gone. Any other God that's allowed standing when we take Jesus into our life, when we place Jesus on the throne of our heart, any idol in our life, any God in our life, that is idolatry. And God won't stand for that. And that's what this is saying. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. Don't bring any gods into my presence. No, 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 no. Whatever we hold on to is an idol. And it tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 14, we're to flee idolatry. Again, in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10, it tells us those who are habitually involved in idolatry will not inherit the kingdom of God. Yay! So it's important that when we come to Christ, when we say, and we profess to be walking with Christ, that we make certain we're not worshiping false gods along with the Lord. No, it's all or nothing. All or nothing. And that's the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, the second commandment looks so different to me because I was raised in the Lutheran church. And in the Lutheran church, this commandment is not in the Ten Commandments. What? So, I know we have some Lutherans here tonight and probably some Lutherans out there. And if you're Roman Catholic, it's not in your catechism either. So, for us Lutherans and Roman Catholics, let's see what the Word of God says the second commandment is. And now you'll see, well, this is what the Bible says. We have to make a choice. Should we believe the Bible or should we believe our, our catechism? Let's take a look. Verse 4. The verse 1, remember, was don't worship false gods. Commandment number 1. Commandment number 2 is don't worship the true God falsely. So commandment one, don't worship false gods. Commandment two, don't worship the false, the true God falsely. Take a look. Verse four, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Well, we can see why the Roman Catholic Church isn't going to go for this. If you've ever been to a Catholic Church, there's carved images in there. Pastor Anthony talked about Peter, remember, at the Vatican. One of my favorite memories of Pastor Anthony teaching. When you go into the Vatican, it's ornate, it's beautiful. St. Peter's Church is, oh my word, it's, it's unbelievably fantastic. You walk in the front door, there's the Michelangelo. I mean, Michelangelo. We're talking the Michelangelo. There's his Pieta right there. The price on that is, there is no price on that. The wealthiest nation in the world could not buy that from the Vatican. It's worth more than that. And that's just in the entryway. That's just going, oh, that's nice. And it goes on and on and on as you go into Sistine Chapel. That's not for sale. You get to see Raphael's, all of his paintings. You see Michelangelo's. It's, it's crazy, the artwork, and amazing. But right there in the middle of St. Peter's Basilica, pews everywhere, there's this huge statue of Peter and a long line waiting to come by and to venerate or to touch the foot of Peter, specifically his big toe. And Pastor Anthony was teaching, said that uh, that big toe has been rubbed off by all the people touching it. And the danger, of course, of tomain poisoning, right there, our main toe, I forget how you said it, but I think it was tomain poisoning, but yeah, craziness, craziness. A graven image, a graven image. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, uh, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, check it out, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, as we look at this, we can see why back in the Middle Ages somewhere, this would serve to be a problem to Romanism. And me being a Lutheran, remember Martin Luther was a Catholic monk. When I learned the Ten Commandments, I didn't learn this commandment. I never even saw this commandment. Once I became born again and I started to actually read the Bible, I remember reading this and going, wait a minute. 
this isn't, this isn't working. I learned, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy is the third commandment. Honor your father and mother is your fourth commandment. You shall not kill is the fifth commandment. You shall not commit adultery is the sixth commandment. You shall not steal is the seventh commandment. That's how I learned them. And yet when I read the Bible, they were off one. I was like, how does this work? Because I know I didn't mess it up. I had to stand in front of my congregation as a little kid and recite the Ten Commandments in front of all the people. Freaked me out. And I remember the numbers that went with my commandments. That was my hook. And it didn't line up with the Word of God, and I didn't know what to do until just recently when I, I saw a reference to a man named Clark, C-L-A-R-K-E. And it said, notice that in Roman Catholicism, there is no second commandment here, verses 4 to 6, in their catechism. I mean, well, there's got to be Ten Commandments, and you look back at 9 and 10, and they took the last commandment, you should not covet your neighbor's wife or any of his belongings, and they switch it into two. Number 9 is you should not covet your neighbor's wife, and number 10, you shall not cover your neighbor's belongings. That's how I learned it in the Lutheran church. It's like, yeah, that makes sense. Well, of course, Luther was Roman Catholic. And then he broke free, but he kept those same Ten Commandments. So that's why there's a bit of a distinction. And we can see why Catholicism would not want to have, well, we, you can't, uh, don't make any carved images. If you go into a Catholic church, I mean, you've, got, you've got Mary statues, Peter statues, Paul statues. You've got statues everywhere, you know. The Bible says don't do that. You don't need a help to worship God. You don't need anything to help you worship who God is. We saw in our Sunday morning teaching not that long ago, remember, that God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And if I have whatever I have, some object to help me picture God, I'm no longer worshiping him in spirit. I'm worshiping him in an image. And the Bible's very clear. Don't worship God falsely. So, for all of our Catholic friends out there, we love the fact that you are so committed to your church. We love the fact that you believe in the virgin birth and the crucifixion, resurrection of Jesus. Stop praying to idols. You don't have to go to the priest to forgive, have your sins forgiven. The Bible says there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So there is no perfect church. We're definitely not a perfect church. Look behind the pulpit, but, and look over here. But, but, so we know that. That goes without saying. So we're not a perfect church, but there is no perfect church. And we've said it over and over and over again. If you ever find a perfect church, don't go there. Because if you go there, it's no longer a perfect church. So just calm yourself. We're not looking here for a perfect church. We're looking to worship a perfect Savior. That's what we're looking for. So important. So important. So we see this second commandment. He says, for I am a jealous God. He's not jealous of us. He's jealous for us. Alan Redpath out over in England. He says he wants the best for us. He says don't settle for less than the best. I'm the best. Worship me. I'm a jealous God. I don't want to see you give your heart away to something that will never satisfy you. I made you. I know what's best for you. Worship me correctly. Don't worship false gods and don't worship me falsely. And those are the first two commandments. You see, he says he's going to visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations. I find that so interesting. The context, remember, is idolatry here. And when a generation enters into idolatry, the consequences of idolatry, not worshiping Jesus 100%, is passed down to the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren. We're looking at first as a national level. When idolatry slips into a nation, the judgment of God is basically, just as we see in Romans, he allows them to have their way. And by the third and fourth generation, we have a, we have a society that is completely an immoral society. We're living in the midst of that downward spiral right now in our nation. How sad it is. Christianity is not making an image of God. True Christianity is allowing God to make us into His image. So we don't make an image thinking this is what God must look like. Not going to happen. But oh, if people could look at me and say, I see, a, I see a, a bit of God in you. When I see you, I, I see Jesus. I like the heart. 
That's a goal. That's true Christianity. And that's where it comes from. It also works on a personal level, not only a national level. And we can look at our own lives. I look back into my heritage. And um, my parents got born again just before I did. I was 19 and they got saved. You know my test. I'm not going to give it to you again. It's ad nauseum. But it really bummed me out when they became a Christian. Because I had Luther Lutheranism down. I was going to heaven and life was good. And I was in the fraternity at a university. I'm loving life. And all of a sudden my dad gets saved and says, no, you're not good. And I'm like, what? You mean you told me I'm good? And no, you're not good. And I was like, oh, man. And that started me coming to Christ. Eventually, I became a Christian back in 1975. But as I look back at my heritage prior to that, it was kind of frustrating because I just couldn't see a strong Christian presence. And as I started digging, I found on my dad's side, I had a grandmother who was a Christian. I was cool. I had a Christian grandma. Yeah, my great grandma. But it was my great grandma I never met, but she was a little Christian gal. Yeah, I got a Christian great grandma. I'm at the farm with my grandma, the one that kind of I, I spent a lot of time with growing up on the farm there, and uh, they had these pictures of all these old people, black and white pictures from who knows when, always around the house. I got to the age where I finally want to know, who's that? Who's that? Who's that? And this is after I've gone into ministry. I just started in ministry back in the early, late 80s. And I'm out in the farm, and I have my little girl with me, and I want her to know who these old people are all around the house. And I, who's that? And she said, my grandma said, I'll never forget. Well, that was my, gra my grandpa. So that had been my great, great grandpa. And, and he believed like you did. And I go, wait, wait, what now? Yeah, he was from Moravia. We're Czechoslovakian, and he was from Moravia, and he was a Moravian missionary. He was a school teacher, and he came to North Dakota here to bring the way you believe the Bible to the people out here on the plains of North Dakota. So like he was a missionary? Yeah, he was a missionary. And he had the same scriptures you're always talking to me about. I said, what do you mean, Grandma? Well, he'd have me on his knee and he'd make me memorize. And i say, like what? And at this time, she was probably 70. And she said, well, like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave it. I go, Grandma, you know scripture? Yeah, all of sin to come short of the glory of God. Grandma, you know this stuff? Yeah, Grandpa made me memorize all that stuff. And it was so sweet to know that there was a heritage that actually went back to believers. It was like, Whoa, this is cool. And all of us have some heritage in our background. You can almost guarantee it. Somewhere back there, there was someone who was praying and saying, Lord, I, I probably won't be around to see him, but bless my kids and their kids and their kids and their kids. And they actually meant it. And here you are. How cool is that? How cool is that? And now it's up to you to pass that on to the next generations. People that will never meet. But they're going to say one day, you mean I had a grandma that was a Christian? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She worked up in that sound booth that washed by the word. Some little dinky church in Albuquerque, and she was up in there. Grandma Rhonda, really? How do you know that? Well, we saw it right in her diary. She said it right here. I can't believe I'm here again. I'm always a... But there it was. And there it is. You don't know how it's going to happen. You don't know. But how sweet. How sweet. Pray. God can... Does the iniquity of the fathers upon the third and fourth generations? That's kind of a scary thought. What we do now affects our kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, and goes forward. And a moment of repentance can change the destiny of our heritage. Think about that. Your great-great-grandchild might come to Christ because you chose to repent and live a godly life today. That's pretty sweet. So that's what he's saying. He's like, I'm going to show mercy in verse 6 to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Then we come to this third commandment. The third commandment says this, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Why not? Well, it says, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And it's one of those things, taking God's name in vain What does that mean, in vain? Well, obviously, without saying, it goes on for profanity. That goes without saying. It's amazing when you play sports as an unbeliever how many times you use the name of the Lord if you hit a high fly ball. Or if you drop a pass. Or if you boot a ground ball. And for some reason, unbeliever, or if you miss the goal. As an unbeliever, you tend to just use his name. If you hit your thumb with a hammer. For some reason, we feel that's the name we should use. I've never, ever heard anybody 
pop up. Buddha grounder, hit their thumb and say, Oh, Buddha! Buddha! Never heard him say it. Unbelievers who don't even believe in Jesus are quick to use his name. Quick to call, I don't, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. And then all of a sudden they will say, God damn it. It's like, you don't even believe in him. What are you talking about wrong with you? It's amazing the profanity that comes out of the mouths of unbelievers. And it's embarrassing the profanity that comes out of the mouths of believers. Using God's name in vain. Not only profanity, but frivolity. Using God's name in a superficial way. Being stupid. Trying to get a, a laugh and using God's name in the midst of it. Using God's name in vain. Hypocrisy. Talking the talk, but not walking the walk. Hypocrisy. Using God's name in vain. And he says, notice, I will not hold him guiltless who takes the name in vain. Now, the Jews took this to an extreme. You remember the story on that. True statement, even today. They refuse to write the name of God. They refuse to say the name of God. So they'll call him the name. Or they'll just write the tetragrammaton. Like, but we're not going to, we're not going to, they'll put in English G dash D. Because they don't want to take God's name in vain. So that's a bit extreme, but at the same time, I'd rather err on the side of caution probably in there. If you're at home, I'd like for you to open your Bibles to Psalm 111. There's something in 111 I'm just going to address. Um, I don't know if it really ties in. I think it does. I'm going to do an interesting bridge to make it tie in. But something I, I, I want to just bring to light. I think it's important enough to do that. I probably should have looked it up in this translation. It's going to be in the Old King James. I don't have the old King James, so I got the new King James, they switched it on me. The old King James, in Psalm 111, verse 9, it says in the new King James, He has sent redemption to His people. He has commanded His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. Reverend in the old King James. It's the only place reverend is used in the Bible. Is in Psalm 111, verse 9. And it means, or it applies to God. How, I can't even think of a word. But I am not reverend at all. And there is no man on this earth that is reverend. God is reverend. So it's not, and I get called that sometimes, I'm doing funerals and that, and it's, reverend, reverend, and I just kind of, I know they want to talk to me, but I just kind of shudder at the thought. Oh. <sighs> no, I'm not a reverend. I'm a sinner, saved by grace, here to serve this body on Carlisle. No different than anybody else. It's just where God has me. Why? You know why. Because God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That's the whole point of that. So, how irreverent, that's a good word, how irreverent it is for me as a pastor to call myself reverend. Only God is reverend. Then we go on, we look at this fourth, this last commandment over here in Exodus. Twenty again. Verse eight. The fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son. This is amazing. Equal rights way back here. Look at this. Nor your daughter, nor your male servant, that'd be employee, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, animal rights, nor your stranger who's within your gates. And that's something. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Two things to notice. The first thing is man should work six days of the week. It says it right there. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. That's what it says. So, yeah, work. 
six days. It says in 1 Thessalonians, let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians, way in the back of the Bible again. We're going way back to Paul's letters, and you're going to hit Romans, the first one, the longest of Paul's letter, then the second longest of his letters, 1 Corinthians, then the third longest of his letters, 2 Corinthians, then the fourth longest of his letters, Galatians, and the fifth longest, they're in decreasing order of length. Eventually, you're going to get to Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians. We always say when you come to a T book in Paul's letters, when you found one T, you found them all. They're all grouped together. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. That you aspire to lead a quiet life. That you aspire to mind your own business. That you aspire to work with your own hands as we commanded you that you may walk properly towards those who are outside, the unbelievers, and that you may lack nothing. So there it is, the key to a brotherly, orderly life, to mind your own business, lead a quiet life, mind your own business, and work with your own hands. Working is a good thing. Work six days. Now take a look at the next book, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. Because there it says this, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, it doesn't say can, it says will not work, neither shall he eat. There are times when disabilities, injuries, circumstances make it such that you cannot work. That's a whole nother ballgame. This is will not work. You have the opportunity to work, not going to do it. No, why should I? Well, then don't eat. How do we teach our children to, to work? That's a great principle. Work, we're going to eat. Well, I'm not working. Okay. We'll talk about it tomorrow. They come home for supper. I'm sorry, that says if you don't work, you don't eat. Well, that's not right. They'll go to bed. They'll get up in the morning. Let's work. I'm not working. Okay, that's up to you. That's just being scriptural. So it's interesting. Two things to notice. Man should work six days of the week. And then notice the second thing in this commandment. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. In it you shall do no work. The seventh day all work shall cease. Notice that seventh day, this Sabbath day, literally means a day of rest. That's what Sabbath means. It's a rest day. I find it interesting, nowhere in the scripture does it say the seventh day of the week. It says the seventh day, which is interesting. It says, work six days, rest a day. Work six days, rest a day. Work six days, rest a day. It does not necessarily by definition mean in God's law that the Sabbath is a Saturday. Doesn't mean that. Isn't that something? That's under Moses' covenant. Yeah, but not under God's law here. God's law is work six days and rest. Work six days and rest. That's why whatever, it's for our benefit. It's like maintenance on a car. You don't have to change oil. You don't have to. You don't have to change tires. You don't have to. You don't have to do it. But if you want to run well, then you, you might want to do that. You don't have to rest every seventh day, but the manufacturer's manual says rest every seventh day. Calm yourself, kick back, kick your legs up, and do nothing. Yeah, but I'm an American. We don't believe in resting. Yeah, but you're a Christian. Follow the owner's manual. And we've seen the results. You see the results of people that choose not to. Oh, man, they, they, they make that extra paycheck every month. They work that side job every month and you see them three years later, they look like they're 80 years old. How old are you now? 27. I mean, come on now. Let's just follow the manual. It will benefit physically, will benefit mentally, will benefit spiritually. Work, 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 rest. Work, 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 rest. It's interesting, I think, on the uh, American lifestyle, because we have a weekend. And we work five days typically in America. Sometimes you work four tens, but typically five, five days. And then we have our day of rest, the way it's set up, and our day of worship. Sweet. And we even say the first day of the week is worship. So we start off the week worshiping the Lord. We work five days and we rest. We worship. That's kind of how it's set up. Now, obviously, many people don't do that because we don't do that. It's more fun just to go camping. 
It's more fun just to hang out in the sports bars. It's more fun to get some work done. But the Bible says rest today. Rest. And if you want to really watch yourself get blessed, worship a day, work hard, rest. Now you're rested to worship. You've given your best to the Lord. You've rested all day Saturday. Now let's worship God for real. And then work. If we start doing that, watch what God will do. I mean, it's pretty sweet what God will do. But it's okay to chill at home and do absolutely nothing. Spend time with your family. Rest. Six days you shall labor, do all your work. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. In it you shall do no work. That's not me. That's just what it says right there. So I would encourage you. I would encourage you. Now, we talk about the Sabbath day, and that brings to mind, of course, today in Christianity, there is a group of folks that believe you need to worship on the Sabbath. And if you don't worship on the Sabbath... You're going to hell. That's the doctrine. So I want to take a look at that real quick. Um, worshiping on Sunday is considered the ultimate sin. In fact, it is taught that if you worship on Sunday, you have received the mark of the beast out of the book of Revelation. So if you've been here worshiping on Sunday, you're sitting with a big old 666 on your forehead right now. And uh, because of that, when we look at the doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventists, man, they are flat-out wonderful Christian people. They're born again. They know Jesus. They're awesome people. And we're going to see them in heaven one day. If you know Jesus, you're going to see Seventh-day Adventist friends and family members in glory because they're going. They are flat-out going. They are going to be blown away to see you there, however, because they are defined as a sect, S-E-C-T. A sect is defined as a group of people who believe they are the only ones guaranteed salvation. And that is the Seventh-day Adventist. But um, I've had, I used to run, yeah, I used to run, I know that sounds weird, but I used to do that years ago with a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And we would go round and round and round on this whole thing on the Sabbath and that. And it was just an interesting conversation. Nice guy, we both loved Jesus, we had to agree to disagree. And he always said, you know, and he would just kind of go like that and but at any rate, this is where we are. He's going to be shocked one day. But as we look at this, should we keep the Sabbath today? Are we wrong not worshiping on a Saturday? Should we worship on Sabbath, a religious day? Take a look at chapter 2 of Colossians. Chapter 2 of Colossians, verse 16. Or let's just, now let's, well, yeah, we'll go ahead and read it. Let's read it. Colossians 2, 16. Paul is writing to the church in this little mountain hamlet of Colossae. It's beautiful. I've had a chance to be in Colossae. It's beautiful. It's like Pecos. It's just up in the mountains, a small little place. So in your mind, when you think of Colossians, think of, I don't know what you call them, Pesconians? They're from Pe Pecos, whatever that would be. But it's beautiful. And he's writing to them. They're kind of isolated. It's just this awesome place. And in verse 16, he says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or what? Sabbaths. He says, don't anybody judge you on a Sabbath? They're a shadow of things to come. The substance is of Christ. Now take a look at Galatians chapter 4, because in Galatians chapter 4, verse 9, check this out. Look at verse 8 as a lead-in. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you serve those which by nature are not gods. But now after you have known God, or rather now that you're known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements? Why are you, Now you know the Lord, why are you going back into this kind of stuff? to which you desire again to be in bondage. What things? You observe days, months, seasons, and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have labored for you in vain. He says, don't pay attention to the days. Every day is the Lord's day. It's not that you've got to worship on Sunday, on the Sabbath, on a Wednesday. Just worship the Lord every day. Just worship the Lord, man. Just worship Him. Don't get caught up in all of that. In closing, yep, you heard me in closing. 
We're closing early. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews in the back of the Bible again. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. There remains, Hebrews 4, 9, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also seized from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. It says, be diligent to enter into that rest that we can only get through Christ. It's not about a day that we are going to, no, 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 no. We're going to find our rest in Jesus. Jesus has done everything. It's all about resting in him. So Sabbath, man, you can have great fellowship with Seventh-day Adventist folk. I mean, love them. They're, they love the Lord. You love the Lord. Enjoy. Enjoy. Don't judge them. Don't judge them. How, how dare we judge them as, for, of judging us. We're doing the same thing if we judge them. So it's, it's great. They love the Lord. You love the Lord. They worship on Saturday. Go worship on Saturday, man. You, got, you do nothing on Saturday anyway, right? It's your day. So go worship. You can worship with a Seventh-day Adventist church. It's sweet. And after that, come worship with us. It'd be awesome. So, the first four commandments. Don't worship false gods. Don't worship the true God falsely. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. And remember the Sabbath day to rest. Keep it holy. Make it different. The word holy means different. Make it a different day. It's a chill day. Whatever that day is for you, chill. If you're working from home, chill a lot, man, if you can. But just chill. Take that day off. So we look at all these. These are the first four commandments. These first four commandments all deal with our relationship between us and the Lord. The next all deal with our relationship with us and other people. So next week we're going to pick up with, chap, uh, with uh, commandment 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. We'll finish off chapter 20. Now, before we have the worship guys come on up, worship guys, it's just Dirk and Connie. Before Dirk and Connie come on up, I'd like us to turn in the Old Testament to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, We're just going to read this because it's a, it's, it's a prayer of Daniel. He's in the Babylonian captivity, and all of a sudden, he starts to pray for his people. And take a look at what it says. We're going to just start in verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that God would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So as Daniel is studying the word of God in a bad situation, he's in captivity, a bad situation, he's in the word of God. He's, he's not watching the local, whatever they would watch back there. He was in the word of God. Things are really bad. i got to get into the Word. And he's as into the Word. He starts to see from the writings of Jeremiah that we're going to be in captivity a total of 70 years. He starts counting. I said, whoa! He's excited. What does he say? Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Prayer, supplications, fasting, and mourning over the sin of the nation. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. He prayed and he confessed. And I said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, notice we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, 
even from by departing from your precepts and your judgments, neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers, and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in the countries to which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness which you have committed against you. Notice, we, 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 us, us, and it continues on. As David prays for his nation who is in a rough place, he identifies with the nation. He doesn't say, forgive them, Lord, they have blown it. I'm the only righteous one around. He didn't say that at all. He says, we have sinned, we have sinned, we have sinned. This is where we are. Then he goes on in verse 8, O Lord, to us belong shame of face to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants and the, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, we'll be looking at that in the next couple of weeks, the servant of God have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. And as is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as is this day, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger, your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. Because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications for the Lord's sake. Cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. I find it interesting. It says we have sinned, and what does he do? He cries out to God. He says we're in trouble, he cries out to God. I look at America, we're in trouble, what do we do? We buy toilet paper. That tells you where we're at. That tells you where we're at. And people will say, well, yeah, we had a day of prayer. A day of prayer, really? A day of prayer. Well, there we go. Where's the toilet paper? That's ridiculous. But I find it so interesting that he identified with the people and said, God, have mercy on us. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are. And we are going to live a life based on your name identifying with you. And that's the key to all this right now. Man, things are messed up right now. God is working on us. It's sweet. <laughs> My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Lesson really loud. But let patience... Bam! I love having this guy around. He's, he's, he knows that stuff. But that's it. Yes. Let patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So instead of hoarding... We should be praying. Identifying with this nation. This nation is messed up. And we're right in the midst of it. Wouldn't it be fun to point fingers, but we can't. We look in the mirror and we say, Ugh, God forgive us. Help us. We need you. We have some? Yay, guys called in prayer requests. So let's pray. And off we go. Let's pray, guys. If you're at home, just, just stay on. Let's pray. 
God, we do just um, want to identify with the people of this nation right now, God, because that's who we are. God, we're asking for your mercy. God, we're asking for your grace, your mercy. God, we need your mercy right now. God, we confess that we have sinned against you in every way possible. God, we have worshipped other gods as a nation. As a nation, we have worshipped you incorrectly. God, as a nation, we take your name, we profane your name, we speak your name in vain. Lord, as a nation, we are workaholics and proud of it. God, forgive us. We have sinned against you in so many ways. God, we're asking for your mercy. We're asking for your protection, God. We're asking you to spare the folks that are already are, are in really dire straits. God, I, I pray for this family in New Jersey that lost so much of their family, God, and I pray that you would uh, just minister to whoever's left there, God. I pray for those that are going to be going in some real rough times over the next months ahead, and God, I pray for your mercy. God, help us. We pray for believers in the midst of this, God, that believers would keep their eyes on you and not on the circumstances. This person calls in, Lord, wanting that their kids would see the signs of the times and come back to the Lord. God, we, we pray for so many. We thank you for the people that have already reached out to different pastors here at the church and said, oh man, I, I need to get right. And God, I pray that it would continue to just grow, that there would be a strong coming back to you. Another prayer request, Lord, that, God, we're praying for the health of the elderly. We pray for the health of the young, too, but for the elderly especially, God. They are really uh, sitting in a precarious spot right now, and God, we pray that you'd protect them. Pray for our president, God, that you'd give him wisdom and clarity, and you'd surround him with people of wisdom, Lord, that know the situation, and that they would be able to speak into his heart and his mind and direct us. God, I, I just pray that you would have mercy on us and speak through our president, our governor, our mayor, our leaders. Another prayer request, Lord, that during these times of social distancing, that families would come back together and that Jesus would be in the midst of the homes. And Lord, again, we pray for those who are struggling with anxiety during this time. Pray for your peace, God, to rest on them. So, Lord, as we just uh, get ready to go back into our homes, God, we ask that you go before us. God, help us to come under the authorities that you have placed in our lives. God, as difficult as it is, God, we do pray that, Lord, we would not make light. God, that we would be shining examples of what it means to be an American citizen, coming under the edicts of our authorities and shining bright for Jesus. Pray for the folks that are still watching. God, I pray you bless these homes, the ones that are watching, the ones that will be watching tomorrow and going forward. God, we ask your blessings to rest on them. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Don't leave yet. we got some more worship going on here. It'll be pretty sweet. All right, thanks. Um, this song really just talks about, you know, we sing, we sing King of Glory, um, but it is. He is the glory in our life. Let's let our lives kind of flow through that, and he's the one pursuing us. So. Who is this king? 